Welcome to an all new episode of the Lisa Ann Experience. I am your host, Lisa Ann, and I would like to extend my gratitude to you for making me a part of your listening experience. It is so much fun getting to be a part of creating a, a podcast and thinking about what conversations would be interesting to you. And if you have any ideas of guests or books you read or topics, you can always send them to me at askleesaann at gmail.com. That is normally for our mailbag, but also I want to hear from you. Um, so send that there. Today I have a great conversation to share with you. But before we get to that, we always have to catch up. It is summer. I am tan. I am about to be tanner. And at this time, when you hear this, I will be in Greece. I am going to Greece with Kay, my absolute favorite travel companion. Uh, we get to explore, try different foods, eat out, go to these shows. Of course, Kay is going to put together a phenomenal package for all of you of behind the scenes content from the Erotic Art Festival, as well as us out doing some excursions, um, thinking about maybe a little workout thing, since everybody wants to know how I work out when I'm on the road. That'd be fun to shoot a little bit of that, but we're going to be creating fun content and also enjoying Greece. And I cannot wait to eat the food. I remember how beautiful the fresh vegetables and fish is, and I am going to be all over it as well as all over getting to see all of my fans there. And I'm super excited about it. I will be still doing the summer of best ball with fan tracks. I have my draft scheduled so they don't collide with what I'm doing in Greece, but yet they're available on Eastern time. So all of the drafts are on Eastern time. The first draft last night was a huge success. I streamed it on YouTube. I had a ton of fun. I felt like we were actually in a draft room together. So I'm streaming all of them. The schedule is going out on my timelines every single day at The Real Lisa Ann. And uh, you can get involved. So we talk a little bit about betting. So, you know, I like to secretly bet the NBA playoffs intentionally to build my bankroll for NFL futures and NFL bets. And there's bets that I like to jokingly called like super basic bitch bets. These are the secret bets that I find that I scour for that are the odds are just crazy. When something's plus 400, everybody just kind of looks at it like, that's obviously Vegas telling me this cannot hit. Nobody likes to give away free money. There's no way I'm betting on that. No, 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 no. If that is a bet where I do the research and I think this is a great possibility, I could review stats from the last 12, 15 games, even including matchups. We're looking at the NBA finals right now, which is the Miami Heat taking on the well-rested Denver Nuggets. So one of the bets was plus 400. It was Jimmy Butler and the Joker, 20 plus combined assists. Now look, seems like a lot. They're both averaging. Look, they're averaging like Jimmy Butler's averaging almost, you know, nine, but yet Joker's the triple double monster. So could Joker then go about possibly balancing out what Butler doesn't? Yes. So I put some money on that plus 400. And winner, winner, chicken dinner, there I was last night. Joker had 14, Jimmy Butler had seven. The entire game, watching and refreshing the box score and watching. And with, with stats like that, your bet doesn't post right away because there could be a correction on like an assist or a rebound or some of these things do happen. So it doesn't post right away. The one that did post right away that I couldn't believe everybody else wasn't on at plus 100 was a triple-double for the Joker. Of course he's going to get one his very first NBA championship game ever. Uh, so I keep that money in my bank. Unless it's big money, then I'll take a little out. But I like to keep that money in my bank, and then that's the money that I'm going to play with. These are bets that you don't want to put a lot of money on. The odds somewhat could seem that they're against you. Unless it hits, then they're very well for you. So did a little bit of that because I am staying up to watch these games in real time, whereas normally I know to uh, watch the first half of a uh, West Coast game. I shower at the second half, I record the game, and I watch the rest of the morning while I'm working in my office. That's normally my protocol. Playoffs, I start to stay up late and watch them. Just throws me off, though. I like to go to bed early. That's just one of my things. I just love it. And so watch the whole game, stare at the stats, have a lot of fun. But these games on fan tracks are only a $5 buy-in. They're a PPR scoring format. It's best ball. 
you just draft, you don't set a lineup, go to the waiver. You don't have to know anything. You just go in there and, and, and don't worry about it for the rest of the season. Top six teams win. So a little bit of gambling, but nothing too aggressive. And the top six teams will win. So the first draft is in the books. Got another one today. 30 drafts in 30 days, fantracks.com forward slash Lisa Ann. I was uh, looking at everyone enjoying themselves at these Taylor Swift concerts. They've been all over. You seems like there's photos posting every weekend and I'm looking, I'm going to see race the movie, the play this weekend with Lady and the girls. I'm looking to see another show and I have some friends coming into town that want to catch something on Broadway. And I am going to go directly to my trusted source at ticket rep. Ticket Rev's going to show me kind of like, I'm going to pick out the area in which I want to see it. And then Ticket Rev's going to show me if something is available in that space. It makes it so much easier. I love the platform. You can download the app at Ticket Rev. Uh, follow on social media at Ticket Rev or learn more about it at TicketRev.com. Limited cities right now, but growing throughout the U.S. And check out when you're traveling to New York, Miami. I think they're in Houston now as well. I'm in Minnesota. So there's definitely different spots. But Check that out. Before I get to my guest, I want to remind you all, I had someone ask me the other day, what is my workout routine? How many days a week do I work out? I thought it was a great question. So I probably work out a little bit harder now than I did when I was younger. I don't get the results that I got when I was younger, but I know I need to continue to push myself. So my goal is to be active seven days a week. Five of them will be in the gym, definitely doing weight training. I'll do some weight training and some cardio. The other two days could be, I feel like just going into the Pilates room and doing a ton of core work. Could be I'm getting out on the city bike uh, to get some exercise, ride around in Central Park. Could be I'm taking a super long walk. Sometimes I'll be like, I'm going to take a five-hour walk today. I'm going to walk until I can't walk anymore because you can do that in the city and it's amazing. Uh, but I'm active. And so don't look at it as this grind of what you're doing, if you factor being active in your everyday life, it won't even seem like this mission that you're on. It will just be a routine part of habit. For me, the habit is as simple as this. I wake up, I slam a glass of uh, water with lemon while my coffee is being made. I take my coffee, I go back to bed. I troll around on some of the news sites. I do a little bit of this and that. I try not to check social media yet. I'm just trying to, you know, enter in once I finish my coffee. And I like to read a lot of very unusual stories, a lot of cooking stuff, different recipes, different nutrition stuff. Like in the morning, my mindset is all like, you know, health and wellness. And then obviously everybody who's like, what is everyone wearing in Paris right now? Top 10 looks. Yes, I have to look at those. Oh, shoes at Nordstrom. Oh yes, I have to look at those. But that's how I drink my coffee. As soon as I'm done with my coffee, I go into my bathroom. I put mouthwash in my mouth. I start swirling that around. I get my earbuds from my office that were charging. I put on my music. I keep this mouthwash going until I'm dressed in my gym clothes. I then peel all the blankets off my bed. I'm not sure if you know this, but you shouldn't make your bed right away. You should actually let your bed air out. So I open my bed completely. I spritz a little bit of linen stuff on it and I leave it there. Then I'm going into the bathroom. Mouthwash is out. I'm brushing my teeth. I take a toner and just kind of cleanse anything from my skin if I put a little extra goop on the night before. And I'm out the door. It's a habit. This is in my routine. Going to the gym and working out or get being out there and getting active is just part of my routine. It's my favorite way to start my day. It's my favorite way to cruise through life. Uh, and then I will get something in the afternoon where maybe I'm like, oh, I'm going to take a walk and go to cryotherapy. I'm going to do a lap at the park um, and get an extra 30 minutes of walking because I've already been stuck at my desk for seven hours, right? So once I feel myself being really still, then I know as we age, we can get a little bit of stiff and you can actually get sore from the gym because you worked out and then you sat still, still, still. We don't want that. So then I'll get out and move a little bit more. But all of this is incredibly important for us to think about the long-term effects of just being active and how we'll recover better when we get sick and all of those things. But as we get older, there's so much more we need to do. And as a woman, this is what I'm doing for me and my optimal health to feel my, be my, my best to, to um, all of the things that I want to tap into. And for guys, you're going to want to feel the juice too. And you want to feel great at the gym and you want to feel that vigor, that feeling that you felt when you were younger. And so maybe for you, 
Ultra Farm RX is what you're looking for. Ever feel like your performance just doesn't measure up? Does worrying about it make it worse? Let me let you in on a little secret. Many men use Viagra and Cialis not just to treat ED, but to boost their performance and last longer. Whether you're in front of the camera or behind closed doors, every man can use a little help to last longer. It's never been simpler to get what you need. At ultrafarmrx.com, you can get doctor-trusted treatments 100% confidential online from your phone. No awkward doctor visits. No waiting in line at the pharmacy, discreet and confidential, guaranteed. Better performance is just a few clicks away at ultrafarmrx.com. Just two minutes right there at Ultra Farm RX to fill out a little survey. A licensed physician will get back to you. And if you are approved, your package will be sent direct and discreet to your door. Before I bring in my guest, I want to read to you what inspired this conversation. And here's what's great. I know I'm going to do a solo episode in Greece, just like Kay and I did when I was in, we were in Switzerland and you know, you like a solo because I have so much to talk about. I've been on this trip. It's going to be great. Do it with the hotel room with this weird green wall, but it ended up looking great. Uh, so I'll be doing a solo and I didn't, I had a guess that, that something changed in their schedule. So I didn't have a, a, a podcast. So Sunday morning I wake up, maybe Sunday morning, Monday morning, one of these mornings, or maybe it was yesterday morning. Well, one of these mornings I wake up. And I am, for some reason, looking at something somebody had sent to me on Twitter, and I just popped on this tweet. When I first left performing, it used to frustrate me because I wanted so much to leave that time in my life behind. I realized that in order to show other performers the truth of departure, I need to share the ups and the downs, including any resistance from the public. Many fans who've questioned my methods are confused about why my OnlyFans is still operating, which is fair. The transition from a full service sex worker to a vanilla, vanilla business owner is often a losing battle for most, leading to a return to sex work or total financial destruction. With remedial learning through advanced business education, my journey teaches others that a strategic exit can be stable, permanent, and fulfilling. It's a tactical process, transforming finances, mindset, and lifestyle. All Joy Inspired and its resources provide sex workers a way out, and it shows them how to thrive in a new business of their own creation. Doing this takes effort and time. Anyone willing to do the work, dedicate themselves to their vision, can accomplish wonderful things. They can leave sex work from behind them if that's truly what they want. My company shows them how. Anyone who reaches out to me for information is safe to do so with the comfort that their identity will always be kept confidential. All who want this education and mentor mentorship are welcome. No judgments, no pressure. Everyone travels a unique journey, and each process is a celebration. If you're an adult industry member and you're curious about what's possible for you after the work is no longer right for you, email me at Elizabeth Spragans at alljoyinspired.com. Your questions will be answered with kindness and compassion. I saw this tweet from Alora Jensen. And I thought to myself, I need to slide into her DMs right now and tell her how moving that was and how much I wanted to have a conversation with her. And what do you know? Right away, she wanted to have this conversation and I get to bring this perfectly timed, it was meant to be, that this conversation about her business, which is all joy, all joy inspired. My guest today, Alora Jensen. I'm incredibly excited to have this conversation and be able to share it with all of you because a tweet inspired me, that tweet that I just read to you and that tweet that we're going to break down kind of point by point. My guest today, Alora Jensen, who you can follow at Alora Jensen. Alora, we share a, a very similar story. It's so great to reconnect with you. I'm actually sitting down and looking at you face to face, kind of in a way. It's been so many years, but I have always had nothing but love for you, Lisa Ann. I agree with that, with you right back at you. And you've paved a new way for yourself. And 
you know, we, we share the mutual reality that yes, we have been in the business. Yes. We still have income streams that come in from the business, but yes, we know that we also have unlimited opportunities to do other things. And so you and I share in that, but I think we also share in the straight up just resistance from others. So tell me your journey and how it's been since you made the decision that you are going to walk a new path and what it's been like for you. Wow. Um, woo. <laughs> there, there are so many parts of this journey. There are so many, so many factors, facets that go into the departure from, from adult industry work. And they are all powerful motivators for me for their own unique reasons. But I decided a couple of years ago that I wanted to start looking for a way to leave adult entertainment. Um, whew, I was not happy with the way that things were changing in the industry, whether it be the risk taking of the testing procedures not being observed by some and putting everyone at risk, or then there was the whole prep thing in place of the HIV security uh, safety protocols. I'm trying to be really careful about what I say. I don't want to offend any of your, of your followers. I'm trying to watch my language. But there are a whole bunch of things that just started happening back to back to back, and the risk versus reward of doing the work became less attractive. So I decided... Um, probably about two years ago, it was, it was time to go and I needed to figure something out. I needed to, I needed to make a living outside of doing the work. I no longer wanted to do sex work and I wanted to be specific because I'm not ashamed of my past. My past does not, um, does not harm me. It doesn't weigh on me, but I used to do sex work. I was, uh, an escort. I did adult film work. I did camming. I did everything. And, you know, when I decided it's just time to go, I found a really great group of people who, uh, who welcomed me and they mentor me even to this day. And what I decided to do was to make that possible for other adult film industry or sex workers aware that they have options outside of the work. Your points were exactly the same as mine. And I was starting to make my decision in 2013. And I'm not sure if you remember 2013 was a really tough year in the industry. We had yeah. quite a few outbreaks. We had a syphilis situation. Mm -hmm. We had positive tests and, and it was the same for me. The risks no longer outweighed the reward. And right. I felt the same thing on the road because I love being on the road. I like being on the road almost more than shooting. Like I love shooting pictures. I love shooting solo stuff, but like shooting can be great or it could be like the most unnecessary, unorganized, chaotic amount of drama day. And you don't know what you're getting. So I didn't like to do that too much. I knew what I was gonna get on the road. I'm out there, if I work hard, I make money. But even on the road, the shows became later. I was at a couple clubs, with really big fights. And you know, wow. luckily a lot of the, I, I made sure that I own my last, three to four years, I only went to clubs that had metal detectors. That's how scared I started to get. And I would ask myself when I'm on stage, I would say like, is this really smart at this age with the knowledge that you've gained uh, to still be exposing yourself this, this way? And that, and that became this repeat kind of thing in my head. And I it was, yeah. whether it was on set, it was the sex work in general, but again, not ashamed of my past. I'm thrilled that I get to still do trade shows and go to Exotica because I get like just enough. I get to wear a lot of makeup. I get to dress really fun yeah. and I get to sign autographs and take pictures, right? But same as you, and there's no harm in admitting your truth. I felt that I offended people when I left the industry and I didn't intend to. It was never my intention. It just was no longer fitting me. Even when it came to the style of scenes, I didn't want to do stepmom stuff. Like, you right. know what I mean? There were just certain things I didn't want to do. And I was like, isn't it enough that I'm doing this? And, and it just became kind of grimy in a sense that I just, I think you can outgrow something. I think we outgrew it. But I think there you sit and you realize I'm going to walk away from 99.9% .9 of my income. Though I might have different streams where I'm getting residuals or something. Maybe I have my fleshlight, you know, these little things. How fearful were you to accept that reality? I wasn't fearful at all. 
I, and I, I got I to gotta make this very, very clear. One of the biggest reasons that I left, among the others that I mentioned earlier, was the change in the dynamic of what we were performing. It absolutely disgusts me that entertainment has turned into a stepmommy, stepdaddy, stepbrother and sister. It disgusts me. And I believe it's contributing to the harm of the American family or otherwise. It absolutely disgusts me. And when that became the only thing that I would get hired to do with the very rare, maybe once a year, not family oriented role, I just, it, it, it just caused me to look around and you know, look to see what, what other options I had. And then when I found what those options were, it was the most horrible experience. I was very, very badly injured overseas, um, very badly injured. It took about six months of, you know, regular doctor's care to get what, through. What, what did you do overseas? Uh, I did some pretty extreme scenes. Okay. And it, the people were really nice to me over there. The, the set people were really nice to me. Um, I was hired to do one thing. And then while I was on set, it was brought to my attention. I was doing something different. And uh, that was an experience I don't wish on anybody, but I, uh, I digress. But the, the thing that led me to do those other scenes was because I no longer wanted to be a part of that whole I, I want to be careful of the words I use on your broadcast. Family oriented and yeah. pretend incestual. under. Incestual. We're in. It's, yes. It's, 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 we're implying incestual activity. Mm -hmm. And you know what? No stepmom likes it. And it's just gross. And it also leads to the feedback on social media where people call me mommy and it right. grosses me out. Why would you mm -hmm. want to have sex with your mom? Like, mm -hmm. that's what I say to them back. Like, why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. It's so gross. Mommy, will you be my stepmom? Yep. Oh, ew. Like, it's yes. just a confusing. Why do you want to have sex with the same woman your dad has sex with? Like, it just became this. Uh -huh. And the ick that I and you, that we both experienced oh, firsthand. Yeah. I, at that time, didn't know how it was going to read to the rest of the world. Even though I'm a forward thinker, I did not know that I would be getting a thousand responses each time I go on an IG live about me being somebody's mom or stepmom or people calling me mommy. Like, I did not even see that coming. And it's just gross and weird. I agree. I totally agree with you. And I think what's even more damaging than the family oriented scenes is the scenes in which the talent is made deliberately to look too young. They're not. And I need to make that clear to everybody who's watching this broadcast. Everyone's age has been verified. And sometimes if they really do look very young and they're at a new studio, they're, they're verified with a newspaper and their driver's license and a birth certificate. So none of these people performing are actually underage, but they're deliberately made to look underage in order to appeal to a certain crowd who's going to be buying this material. And when that became a very normal thing, when I would get a script to go to work, I said, I don't want to, I don't want to be entertaining people who are sexually aroused by a male or female looking like a child. I don't want to be part of that. I don't want to be known for that. I don't want to be the reason somebody can't find a, a an adult scene with an underage looking talent and they decide to go find an underage or actual underage person to satisfy that need. I don't want to be the reason somebody does that. And it, it was it was when that became a mindset that I'm actually harming children, potentially harming children by producing this sort of entertainment. I said, I'm out. I'm out. This is all you guys are making now because it's what people are paying for. I can't do this anymore. So you guys, you have at that. I completely agree with you. And I also had experiences when I had my agency where it was the, the girls that were, you know, in their early twenties, but they would say like, I don't want to be put in pigtails on set. Cause they did look super young. And they're like, I also don't want to have sex with somebody my parents' age. So they had feelings about it, right? But when you're new in the industry, if you don't yeah. have somebody behind you, or that's all the work you're going to get offered. And so that layer was really uncomfortable for me. I did a couple of scenes where I tried them once, and then I realized I will, I don't, if I do something that I don't want to promote and I don't want to right. sell, take out to a trade show or at that time to a club, then I shouldn't be doing it, right? Right. It's not enough money to change my life to put me out there in that way. And so there was that layer. Then there was also this really aggressive content 
that if I wasn't getting hired to shoot a mommy, stepmom, disgusting family oriented scene, I was getting hired for something that was a, a lot more extreme than just what my sexual preference is. And let me say this, yeah. I am not kink shaming anyone. I'm right. not saying if you like that, that's wrong. But the choking, the spitting, the violence mm -hmm. towards women, which was never present when I got in the business in the 90s because mm -hmm. it just wasn't legal, has right. led to a confusion for young people. And I'm working with a program that went down and interviewed a bunch of young people at a music festival. When I say young, 18 to 35. And there, every, every girl said she had been surprised, slapped across her face during sex, surprised, choked during sex. Guys admitted they choked their girlfriends and it, and it ruined the entire experience. So that layer as well, I was looking at both sides. I'm like, I, okay, like none of this does it for me. And what are we doing? Because yeah. what we're doing on set mimics something, but you know, there's been accidental deaths in the United States while people are strangling during sex. Yeah. Oh yeah. And even to the point where people auto, auto, uh, erot auto as asphyxiate themselves and they're, and they're, you know, with the belts or the ropes. I, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I'm not judging anybody either, Lisa Ann, but I'm kind of like, to each their own, um, to each their own. And I honestly believe that entertainment reflects the desires and the values of society as a whole. And what is being made is what's being requested, is what's being paid for. And when I began to look for a way out, and I was already stuck because I was making a certain amount of money. And with that certain amount of money, I acquired obligations. I was taking care of several households. I have a staff I have to pay now. I mean, even, even today, I have people to pay. I have overhead to cover. And just leaving the business would not only interrupt my life, which I was fine with, but just suddenly turning my back on it and saying goodbye, I would affect a lot of people. A lot of people would have been hurt by that decision. So even though I had a calling to do something different, I wasn't willing to harm other people's lives. So I had to look for a way out. And what was the first uh, thing that you did? The first thing that I did was I sat down and I, I closed my eyes and I sat down and I said, what is it that I wanna do? What do I wanna do? What would make me happy in my heart? And what would make me feel as if I was righting the wrongs of the harm that I feel that I've caused by doing that sort of, you know, those sort of scenes. And it, it, it came into me, I decided, and a voice came to me and told me that, show other people how they can leave too, that they're not stuck. And it's not hating on the adult industry because someone attempted to assassinate my character about two weeks ago and say, oh, she's hating the adult industry. She has no business doing this uh, coaching thing. And I'm like, yeah, but if you watch my, my broadcast, you see that that has nothing to do with anything that I say. And in no way do I shame the adult industry. What I do is I offer resources and education for adult industry members and sex workers to show them that they have business skills. I mean, to be successful like you or like many others on the outside, their, their chances are is that they're already harnessing these skills in marketing and in money management and in so many ways. Everything from editing to content creating mm -hmm. to managing content mm -hmm. to, um, you know, booking these events. You know, a lot of us deal directly. Yes. I didn't have an agent in the industry and I have an agent now, but I still book all of my adult stuff directly. I like talking directly to the people that yeah. I'm going to these trade shows for. I want to see them on a Zoom. I don't want somebody to relay the message for me. So, you know, I get all of that. And it, it is very important that you looked at it and said, I still want to find a way to keep this team intact because I have mm -hmm. a good team. Yeah. And yet I know there's forward thinking individuals to not misunderstand what either of us are trying to say here and to see the reality that we have nothing against the industry, but it's just like being an athlete or 
maybe even a supermodel. You have a shelf life that you can do this where yeah. your body is at its best, uh, when your health is at its best, and when you are in the mindset that this is a comfortable space for you. Anything could change. You could meet someone and decide you want to settle down of a family. This business is one business that doesn't allow a lot of flexibility. Any right. other career, if you decide with your partner you want to have kids, guess what? You get to go to work. You might even get, you know, a pregnancy leave. He might even get paternity leave. Like, you know, we're not in that space. And so I think it's important to plant the seed as soon as somebody gets in the industry of thinking about an exit strategy. Because when you start thinking about getting out, for me, it was a financial goal. Um, you actually have a goal. Like you're like, okay, if I make this much money, then I'll sit down with myself and say, I shouldn't be here anymore. Or should I be here longer? Right. That is so important. So when you first start mentoring someone, do mm -hmm. you find that, uh, they're in the financial space they should be, or do you think it helps them excel their savings and get more responsible fiscally? Well, each, each, each person is unique. Each person has a a walk of life that speaks to their experience. And what I do is I address all areas of their lives which may have been affected by doing adult industry or sex work, uh, personal, physical, and professional. But we have a fourth one. We help them find their purpose. So we, we address all of these issues to make a solid, a solid transformation, to make a complete belief in themselves that other things are possible by showing them that they have options in each of those areas and how to achieve those goals. I love this so much. It's so important. And I think another very important thing is for us all to get out of our own head mm -hmm. because how the world perceives us can almost be suffocating on a daily basis. So social 100%. media is that place. You know, the content that we did is not time sensitive. A new guy sees you and, and thinks you're still doing this and comes at you and he comes at you hot. And so how do you tell people that you're working with, the teams that you're working with, you, the people you're mentoring to mi minimize that noise? Because you can almost believe that everybody is thinking those thoughts about you. I had oh, to yeah. get out of my own head. I mm -hmm. had to tell myself, like, I would tell myself, like, Lisa, not everything is about you. Nobody gives a fuck about what you used to do. Like, cause I was going into big rooms for Sirius XM with a ton of people and, you know, doing broadcasts. And I was really nervous about what people thought about me for yeah. a short period of time. It was very short, but I was testing myself in a new world and I was all in. I was like, the first thing I wanted to do was get my boobs reduced. So I just felt yes. more comfortable in spaces because it was hard to get tops, you know, those little things. But how do you express to someone how important it is to minimize that noise, which can be very, very distracting and discouraging for someone trying to change their life? I, I compare it to recovering from addiction. Um, sometimes when people recover from addiction, they have to remove themselves from certain circumstances and situations um, and environments maybe uh, so they can heal in their heart and spirit and their body. But there are triggers that will affect the way that you know, a former, you know, performer feels about themselves. And the first time I went into a large crowd of people, I was terrified. I, I said, these people all know who I am. They, they can look at me because I had not had my chest repaired at that point. And I was still giant, like you said. <laughs> and I said, these people aren't going to listen to me. But you know what? That was the very first time I had a captivated audience. I was speaking in front of a large room a large room of people and they were staring at me. Now, probably because my, I had these giant, you know, circus like implants still in my chest at that point, fine, whatever the need be, but they got my message. They got my message of hope. And the next time that they saw me, I had no implants like at all. And my chest was completely flat because I had to have pec repair done to the muscles on my chest. And I wasn't able to get implants again for several months, but they still listened to me. And that, that sort of switched things around in my head that it's not necessarily what I look like. People won't always remember what you say, but they will remember how you make them feel 
They definitely remember how you make them feel. So what I was saying to these people was making them feel a certain way, making them feel hope or inspired or that they weren't alone anymore. So they didn't care that I looked like a circus freak, you know, and they didn't care the next time that I looked like a mastectomy patient. They didn't care. They were, they wanted the message. They wanted the feel. And that's what I teach people. People won't care as long as you think they will. And if they do come at you in the way that you're describing, they're not meant to be a part of your world. Block them, you know, mute them, or or just ignore them if, if they're in different situations. But they eventually go away. Because when people do that, when they attack a woman who used to be a performer or a sex worker, and they just constantly want to throw it up in your face, it's because they want to hold you in that mentality to drag you back into the work so they can say, I was right. <laughs> I don't, you know, right? No. Uh, I, I, during the football season, every Sunday, I put bets on social media, right? So yeah, we're going to talk. I, <laughs> I know within the first five responses that one of them is going to be like, I liked you better with dick in your mouth. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, yeah. I beat a New Year's resolution this year not to troll trolls. I have an assistant who cleans the streets for me. So what my assistant does is goes onto YouTube, gets rid of all the negative comments. Because you know what? Yeah. I don't need to read it. Look, I understand constructive co criticism and she'll keep that there for me to respond sure. to. All right. A suggestion sure. or what have you. But it's the creepy stuff that I realized I was consuming anywhere from four to five hours of it a day. And oh, because yeah. I'm still putting myself out there in the public eye, which makes my move a little bit more challenging, I have that net of feedback that's going to come to me. And so, you know, each December, I write a pie chart of everything I spend my time on. And then I evaluate it the week between Christmas and New Year's, such a door. And that's I do this cool. to think about what things I shouldn't be doing any longer that I could pass off to someone else and what things are, are, are valuable, what things are bringing me joy. And I realized a couple of years ago, like, these negative comments are not helping me. And if I'm at a point where maybe I'm a little hungry, tired, what have you, they can defeat me. And now I'm just so past that, but it's suffocating. And what people don't realize is that they're not in a vacuum. They're one of a thousand of those messages that you're going to see in one day. So I think limiting exposure is a big one, but mm -hmm. have you had anybody come to you that you're working with that has talked to you about social media affecting them in a negative way and has All it affected time. you in a negative way? It It's because I, I lead by example and it's this, I've actually been going through this process over the last two years. I only quit performing August 17th of 2022, but I've been preparing for almost two years. And I didn't actually launch my business until this past October. So like I prepped social media first. And when I started prepping the public and what I teach my, my clients or my students is that there is a way to slowly transform your social media accounts for them to see you differently because people will react how you tell them to. And if I thank them in the post for being happy for me, that is their direction to be happy for me. <laughs> and there, there are a lot of mental marketing tricks that can be, that can be useful to help. And you'll see, you'll see as you see the adult stars start to leave the industry when the time is right for them, not because I'm encouraging people to do that, but when the time is right for them, you'll see them start to take certain steps. And I'm hoping that's because I'm showing them how. Yeah, you're completely right. And, and also there's still a place for that. You can still have your only fans and still be mm -hmm. making streams of income yeah. from things that you're doing. You're just not on set anymore. Maybe you're not, you're, maybe you're recycling content. You're still sharing. So oh, there's yeah. still a place for that, but eventually your Instagram becomes like, okay, maybe a bikini, but no lingerie. Like I remember when I made that decision, I was like, okay, yeah, you know, this was like many, many years ago. I was like, okay, you could, the most skin you're ever going to show is in a bathing suit from this moving forward. There's no sexy shots with, and, and, I, and, and there's nothing wrong with that, but because I had to pivot, I had to define things that maybe another woman wouldn't have to. So I had to make a, a deeper line in the sand of demarcation to really take that step. How has this felt for you to be on this journey and not just yours, but be alongside others as they go through theirs? Liberating, absolutely liberating. When, um, when someone is doing a job or a kind of work that makes them unhappy or makes them not like their world, 
you feel trapped and you feel suffocated and you feel defeated. So when I started doing things in a way that made me happy, I felt free. And I'm hoping to provide that to other people who feel in, like they're in a dark place, like they, they don't have any options, like they're stuck or condemned because of the work. Feel free. I'm happy. And, you know, we also got to experience things when they fit into our lives. And this doesn't just mean the adult business. I think there's many people that a career change is something that they desire and they're not taking those first steps. You pointing out those four characteristics, I think is really helps people feel stronger about it, but it's not saying you want to change something. I have a friend who started an app called Con Connect that I've had here on my podcast. And they get it's like a LinkedIn for ex-cons to be able to get jobs and to be able to get housing. Cool. It's very, very cool. And now they're getting to go in months before release and kind of like a guidance counselor, you know, go in and prepare them. How long has it been since you've been in touch with technology? Like, what do you need to know? What do you what's your gap span? Has it been 10 years? What have you? How early do you suggest someone in the industry that knows, hey, I've had fun doing this. I think I maybe want to do this for three to five more years. I want to have a really strong exit strategy. Like, what is the time frame that you say can help them ease into this? And they don't have to tell other people in the business. But I didn't tell right. people. I don't think you told people either. I told my people on my social media first. I just um, retired. That was it. Done. We don't have to announce this, but how long is the sweet spot for you to start working with them and getting to know them, to prepare them for what's on the outside world? Oh, wow. It's, uh, it can be different for everybody. That's why it's a, it's a coaching, it's a coaching experience. It's recommended to hire a coach, even if it's not me or one of my people, it's to hire a coach because everyone's different. I recommend when people get into the industry and they're not quite sure how they feel about it yet, to start learning about money, about business, about all kinds of things like taxes and and how to have employees, management skills. Start learning these things right away. Um, but for those who have been in for a while who are kind of kind of testing the water outside to see what's possible, it can be done in about six months, but I recommend a year, maybe two years to make it super smooth and easy. But if you're in a time crunch, uh, six months can take care of business. It's fascinating. I love that you have found yourself something that really brings you joy. How has Thank the you. response been from your fans? Well, <laughs> the fans who, uh, who appreciate the fact that I'm a part of their life, either as an entertainer or as someone interesting to interact with, they, uh, they mind their manners. They don't attempt to insult me for my previous lifestyle, right? But then we have the occasional person almost every day though, and is, this does happen often, they identify themselves. They're, they're angry at the world for some reason and they're mad that I left performing. They're really angry about it. And they want to explain to me how I'll never be successful doing anything but putting a dick in my mouth. So I usually try to talk to them and I've been successful a few times on social media when people attack me. I've, I've, been, I've been able to reach across that bridge and say, hey, you're being, really, you're being really nasty right now. How about we just have a conversation? And I've been successful a few times, but for those who just want to do a drive-by, you know, you and run, yeah, they're not welcome. <laughs> I, I block those people. <laughs> I block a lot every day, especially Twitter and Twitter's gotten worse, but oh my God. I now know, I now know how I feel, like how mm -hmm. my vibration is the second yeah. I read the tweet. And because I gave it up for um, a new year's resolution where I'm not going to have the conversation back, I just block everybody. But for you, it's yeah. a great example that you're setting for everyone that you're helping because they mm -hmm. see how you're handling it. And also mm -hmm. if you can change one person's mind, then potentially they won't attack the next person that leaves. So I see your, where you're going with this and, 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 yeah. it, and it's right, but it's constant. And I also think, you know, we go back to the scenes, the style of scenes that we talked about. Now, yes. the last layer here to me is something I went on a total rampage about, um, with Twitter is the fact oh. that there's no age gate. Okay. We know that people are giving their kids phones younger and younger. Yeah. There's people posting self-made content that is not regulated yeah. that I cannot tell if the person's 18. As a matter of fact, yeah. I don't know if they gave consent and it's right. on these timelines every day. And what I think mm -hmm. has happened 
We know that, you know, last year the FBI named the greatest terror threat in the United States as incels. And we know that incels being involuntarily celibate men addicted to porn, started watching Mm -hmm. porn too young, do not Mm -hmm. develop that empathy, you know, the whole testosterone dope would be really, it's just like video games that get addicted. Yes. It's creating the access that we've allowed is creating so much confusion that even the way guys speak to me on Twitter is a sense that because they've seen me do that, they feel entitled to be with me, date. Like nothing irks me more than when people ask me out on a date on Twitter. I'll joke around on social if I want to live and say, you know, I'm not on a dating app. This is social media, what have you. But they feel that confused that that's how it works. And I'll tell you, my last couple tours on the road, I would fight with guys because they would want to pay me to have sex with them after my shows. And I would say no. And then they'd say, well, you took money in the business. It was just like this back and forth. I was like, okay, this is a graphic. How much do you think this ease of content has been destructive and not, it's not well-regulated on the internet? Um, It's, and that was one of the changes that I was alluding to earlier. Uh, Things have changed so much. When I joined the industry in 2011, it was a whole different experience. But the, the saturation of the entertainment market with unregulated or even just low brow, low brow and distasteful as far as the family, fake incest, fake underage scenes. And now there are scenes with people in diapers pretending to be babies. And I'm like, who are, you, who are we entertaining with this? And if this is what people are seeing as their introduction to sexuality. They don't know that it's not normal. They don't know that this is not how men and women or men and men or women and women or whoever, this is not how people interact sexually. This is pretend. But if that's all that they see when they are actually in front of a live person, like what you were saying, they think that it's normal to act a certain way. And I believe it's been very harmful, very harmful. And at the same time, we're doing less sex education in the United Mm. States than ever. Mm -hmm. Multiple countries are in an STD crisis. I went to Greece during the pandemic to do a series of commercials for Durex because porn's getting into a culture that never had porn because they started getting it on Twitter and other places that, remember, Mm -hmm. porn's banned in the Islamic culture. So they're seeing porn, they're having sex and teen pregnancy, teen suicide, like just a dramatic tear. I just got invited to go to Norway because they're having an uptick as well as Scandinavia. So this is something I'm very passionate about. And I think it's just because watching so young, okay, let's, Mm -hmm. let's, let's see, you know, you're a young man, you're watching way younger than you should. You try to have your first sexual experience when you've watched 30 hours of film a week. And Mm -hmm. by the way, it doesn't stand up to any of those. Next thing you know, you're doing it all wrong. So you have to adapt and do what you thought worked. And that would be not use a condom. The -hmm. fact that we don't even just have a little disclaimer before a movie that the talent in these scenes is tested and does not mean that you should be out there having unprotected sex. I mean, we are missing a great opportunity to just drop that little thing in there. Yeah, I, I, I believe um, that it would be helpful if the adult industry would, would promote condom use and safe sex. But that's, I mean, I've always wondered why that was never done. Um, I also wondered why the whole prep thing became a big deal. I, uh, I was a little discouraged by that. I was a little discouraged by prep. Now, I know it's, it's helped a lot of people in certain situations, but to use it as a means of prophylactics, um, That was scary. Timing really is everything. And the timing of being like in bed, I don't have a guest. I'm going to do a solo. I'm going to put some reports together. What are we going to do? Uh, And then that beautifully written tweet and the post and and the fact that we should be connected. Maybe Alora is going to be mentoring someone who wants to get into the broadcast space or have a podcast or write a book, things that I've done that maybe I could offer some of my insight. And I was really just reaching out to tell her how wonderful I thought that message was. And we ended up in this developed conversation. And I was like, let's just have this on my podcast and let's share it. And I think it was fantastic. So really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alora Jensen. Please follow at Alora Jensen. I'll make sure you have all of the social media right. It is time 
for the mailbag of the week. You can email me at asklisaann at gmail.com. If you have a question, let's get this party started. And here we are, the moment you've all been waiting for, which is the Ask Lisa Ann mailbag. We've got a nice bunch of really non-creepy questions. Pretty exciting. Matt writes, do you plan on visiting Canada cities in your travels like Toronto or Vancouver or Calgary? If so, these cities would be very good YouTube video ideas. Also, when you eat your Smarties, do you eat the red ones last? Last question for you today, have you visited Italy and what's your favorite spots in Italy? Let's go to the first one, Canada. I've traveled all over Canada. I've been to every country. I don't have any plans currently to do events in Canada. It's a little bit different. It's really hard to get a work visa in Canada, so it's very hard for Americans to go there and do events. It used to be different. In the 90s, it was much easier. We went there a lot. Um, But so I don't have any plans, but follow my timelines. If any of that changes, you will know. I don't eat Smarties. I used to many years ago. And Italy, I have been to Italy many times. I spent a month all over Italy in 2018. I absolutely loved it. I love the big cities, but I also love the smaller areas. Got to visit a lot of different spots. One of my favorites was an island um, off of Venice, and it was a San Clemente resort. They had the whole island. It It was red dress service. It was really, really beautiful, elegant, one of the best brunches ever. And uh, it was amazing. But I love Cuneo. Um, I, I, of course, love to go to Florence and go shopping, best shopping in Florence. So I love Italy. And if you haven't visited, you should. Next one. I've got a question for you. What types of movies do you like to watch? P.S. It was great meeting you at Exotica Chicago in April. Sincerely, Kevin. So movies. I will say that recently I've realized I like a good murder mystery, but I don't like a good murder movie. So like, I love the White Lotus series. I was like, Ooh, give me a little mystery. Okay. I'm down. But before I realized that I had this, uh, enjoyment for murder mysteries, I love rom-coms. I love any movie that has a lot of style and some great music and maybe it travels and I get to see different places. I did just watch the mother with J-Lo. Thought that was a great movie because you did get to see some other places, including Alaska, which made me think of Kay. Um, but I love a, I love an easy, a feel good. I'm, I'm very light when it comes to movies. Kind of very boring, but I love a good rom-com. I can't pass up a comedy. I love Step Brothers. I love the other guys. But then I love Bridesmaids and I love The Devil Wears Prada. So like there's movies that I'll go back and rewatch. I love Monster in Law with J-Lo. That was like a great rom-com. Give me a good rom-com. I'm super happy. Next email right here. Again, don't forget, asklisaann at gmail.com if you have a question. Okay, Tom says, I've got a two-part question for your mailbag. First, what is the greatest sporting event you ever saw live in person? And second, what is the one sporting event you you wish you were able to see live in person? Great question right there, Tom. Thank you so much. Easy. Best sporting event I've been to so far in my life is the Kentucky Derby. The style, the hats, the money, the everything about it and the amount of money that is gambled. You can be on an app when you're there and it shows you how much money is being deposited on site. And it is so crazy to think that you are in a place where millions upon millions upon millions of dollars are moving, like 30, 40, 50 million, like insane. I love the Kentucky Derby, everything about it. Um, Everyone just comes out, you know, dressed to the nines. Like it is epic. And I'm so glad I got to go. I would go back again, but before I go there, I want to go to the Masters. Um, The Masters is just such an epic PGA event. Uh, So that's on my bucket list of sporting events. I've been to quite a few Super Bowls. I've never been to a Stanley Cup championship. So I have a nice little list, but priority right there would be the Masters. Thanks for that great question. Braid's got a question for me. We've got two more right here. Dear Lisa, I always notice how amazing how both of your plants look, especially your money manifesting plant. By the way, Braid, I watch that thing like crazy. If it's having any sort of weird moments, I'm like Googling it. I'm like freaking out about it because I feel like it's bad luck. It's a money tree. Right now it's growing in a weird direction because obviously it wants to be closer to that light, but I'm afraid if I move it directly into the window. It's going to be too much sun. Like I go through it. (laughs) So you ask a question and I tell you, there's some emotion attached to keeping these things alive. It's not a fluke. Okay. 
What I recently learned about money trees is the best way to water them is to just put a couple ice cubes on the soil. They will absorb the water when they need it. So a couple of ice cubes, but I have a lot of great natural light in my place too. So that really helps. Second thing is my question is with all the constant traveling you've done over the last year, how do you maintain watering your watering schedule for each of your plants to keep it hydrated and radiant? I hope you're enjoying your amazing summer and I can't wait to see your new adventures. Safe travels for you and Kay. Take care. Braid, love you. So my building offers a plant watering service. So when I'm gone, I go onto an app and tell them exactly when, and then I leave the exact instructions of how much water each one should get. And somebody comes in and waters my plants. Before I had this, I have these balls that you can buy on Amazon that have a stem and you fill them with water before you leave and stick it deep in the soil, and it will take the water as it needs it. It won't all dump out because you fill it and the water will go through. So that was a backup method. Last but not least, Matt says, one question. If social media was to suddenly disappear, pretend this, would it freak you out? Okay, if it was across the board, and it disappeared for everyone. And we were all back on an even playing field out of my control, not freaking out. We would then again have to pivot to how we're earning an income because many people like myself are making money by creating content for different brands. So it would be a financial shift for sure. But obviously if everybody was dealing with this same shift, we'd be moving that into another space. So I would have to then just adapt. It's all about adapting. I remember when it wasn't here, and now I know what it's like when it is here, but it is here. I kind of think it's here to stay. I appreciated the question to all of you. I'd like to thank my sponsors, um, Ultra Farm RX. Go to ultrafarmrx.com forward slash Lisa and check out your two minute survey. Guys, you want to feel your best, especially in the bedroom. I know I do. It's another reason why I'm always pumping iron and working out. Ticket Rev, follow on social media at Ticket Rev. Go to ticketrev.com, learn more, download the app, and see what live events you can see today. And fantracks.com forward slash Lisa Ann. Do you want to draft with me? Do you want to be in a season long league with me? I I'm going to pick 11 people out of these 30 drafts and I'm going to commission a brand new league and you might be one that's invited. So sign up, get in one of the drafts. If you're unable to draft or you want to learn more about it, you can watch each draft as I stream live on my YouTube channel, The Real Lisa Ann. All of my social media is The Real Lisa Ann. My books are available at shoplisaann.com. The Life and The Life Fact arrive personally autographed. The audio versions are available on both of those. So Follow me on social. You'll see everything that I've got going on and you won't miss something new. Thank you so much for listening to an all new episode of the Lisa Ann Experience.